Hi, I'm Michael, and welcome to Beyond the Screenplay, the podcast where each week we do a conversational deep dive analysis into a film. Today we are talking about Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, the 1989 film directed by Steven Spielberg, screenplay by Jeffrey Bohm. I'm here with the Beyond the Screenplay team, Trisha Rand. Hello, everyone. Brian Bittner. Hello, Junior. And Alex Gallardos. <laughs> Hi. Okay, so here we are at the third entry in the Indiana Jones series. Some might call it a trilogy. I am no longer going to refer to it as a trilogy. Wow. I'm going to refer to it as a series. That's a little bit of the hint of what (laughs) might come in our Kingdom of the Crystal Skull conversation, which is a patron-exclusive episode that you can listen to today. The link to take you directly to our Patreon and to that episode will be in the show notes, but... Yeah, so so we're going to talk about The Last Crusade, and then we're going to go talk about Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, and I think it's going to be a fun conversation. Uh-huh. It is the Blanchest movie no. of the four. <laughs> no. Whatever the, whatever the adjective is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. I, Already. I applaud the effort. I applaud the effort. <laughs> but yeah, so we've been doing this Indiana Jones series because of our patrons on Patreon who helped us pass our 750 patron goal. So thank you again to them for making that happen. And we have some new goals to announce. So for 900 patrons, we're going to do a public episode on our favorite films of the 90s, and then a patron exclusive episode on our favorite film of 1999. Because we all know that is the year that has basically as many great movies as the rest of the decade. So yep. So we're not going to be including 1999 in our best of the decade episode. Right. right. So we're going to... Top 90. 10, 90 to 98, top 5, 99. And even then, it's going to be hard to whittle down, I think, in the, yep. in the year 1999. Because, yeah. yeah. wow. And what order to put them in? Oh, no. Yeah. It'll be a challenge, but one I look forward to. <laughs> And then for 1,000 patrons, we're going to do another trilogy like we did with Lord of the Rings and obviously right now with Indiana Jones. But we're going to have you guys, you listeners, vote on which trilogy we should do. And so starting today through August 27th on our Twitter and our Patreon and the Spotify app, any of our socials, basically, you'll be able to vote between Back to the Future, the Godfather trilogy, and the Toy Story trilogy. (laughs) (laughs) Difficult. They're all so similar. (laughs) It's just like the Indiana Jones trilogy. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Yes. Certain trilogies are just trilogies you need to vote on. So yeah, so let us know on, again, Twitter, Patreon. If you're listening to the Spotify app, check out the polls, and you guys will decide which trilogy we talk about for 1,000 patrons. So once again, thank you to our patrons for making all this happen. We are here. Let's dive into Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Alex, tell me about (laughs) your relationship with Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. I mean, as I've been saying in all the episodes leading up to this one, this is my Indiana Jones movie. It always has been. It's what I have the most like cellular memory of from childhood. (laughs) And watching it again... I was just so delighted to confirm that I think it's like a perfect movie. Like this movie is everything I want from a Spielberg film, like pitch perfect. Like the John Williams score, I think is the best of the whole trilogy. Okay. The Sean Connery of it all. The (laughs) father, son Spielbergness of it all. The way the action scenes are shot and edited and the way they unfold all feels pitch perfect in a way that the first two movies in the trilogy I appreciate the action and I love so many set pieces in those films, but they don't feel perfect to me in the way that Last Crusade feels perfect. Huh. Uh, and it's just there's something about the way they just, I think he just nails it in this one. So I, yeah, I just have an undying love for this movie. I was worried watching it again. I haven't seen it for many years that it wouldn't hold up as well, or maybe it was just childhood, you know, nostalgia, but Man, this is a great movie, and I love it so much. It's really up there for me, and I, I need to start adding it to like my top lists. I think you know because it, watching it again, it is up there with the Star Warses and the other big Spielberg movies. When I really think back, like this is one of my favorite Spielberg movies. So making some big claims here, Alex. Yeah, <laughs> this is just 
how I feel. Wow. And I felt it again. Nice. I mean, yeah, that's great. Okay. Well, so coming out of the gate, we got lots of positivity. <laughs> Trisha, <laughs> tell me about your relationship with Last Crusade. I mean, I also love this movie. This is, you know, this and Raiders to me are like the epitome of Indiana Jones, which is something that I love, love, love. And this one we had taped off television. So nice. we had, you know, the hand labeled VHS tape. And clearly my dad had been watching it while he was taping it because he had cut when there were commercials and nice. then had like come back in. So the commercials Board were pause. edited mm. out of it. Yeah. But it had also some edits for content for TV. So like the uh -oh. swear words had been taken out of it and, mm -hmm. and things like that. But this one, I watched a lot, that version of it. Right. So it was like, I had the hand edited <laughs> VHS that we watched a lot, but it's great. I mean, this movie is just an incredible way to wrap up a trilogy. I think for all the things that we can say about the Indiana Jones series, I think it is still okay and canon and not necessarily disrespectful of Crystal Skull to call the first three movies a trilogy and then there yes. are additional Indiana Jones adventures. I think we can mm -hmm. kind of think of it that yes, way. Yes, that's fair. And this one feels, we could talk about it, very much in conversation with closely related to Raiders because Spielberg was trying to return to what made Raiders so successful. Mm -hmm. But it also does a lot of stuff that's new and great. And the entire you know core backbone of the story being about him and his father is brilliant. Like, mm -hmm. it is a brilliant approach to this chapter of the Indiana Jones trilogy. And I'm so glad it went that way because it has this really meaty feel to it where it feels like it is the stakes are, are real in a way that they don't necessarily feel like they're real, even in Raiders, I think, where there's something truly at stake here for the characters and for us as the audience member. There's, you know, it has this, finale feel to it where they're wrapping up something and you know leaving nothing behind but they're just really going for it and it's it's impressive from start to finish so yeah lots of love for this movie I'm here for Alex's enthusiasm. I want to hear a lot more <laughs> from Alex this episode and why it's perfect. Perfect is a big word but I'm I'm willing to entertain that argument. I think there's an argument for it to be made. I agree. <laughs> Excellent. Cool. Okay. And Brian, what about you? Yeah, uh, between this and Raiders, I can't remember when I saw them Like as a kid. I definitely know that I saw Last Crusade as a kid because I have a very vivid, vivid uh, memory of, um, <laughs> <laughs> of being at a friend's house and we were watching it in the night at the end waving goodbye. Like that's just burned mm -hmm. into my brain, mm -hmm. you know, just like watching that moment. But I definitely didn't see it a ton as a kid. So then it was over like early 20s or something where I started just would watch this trilogy and you watch it over and over. And I think that between this and Raiders, I love them both. But with Raiders, my appreciation is like the tiniest bit higher than my actual enjoyment of watching it, like the entertainment mm. level. Mm. There's like maybe a tiny bit of it where I'm just like, oh, it feels like a little slow paced here, or a little, you know, whatever. And that's like, again, we're talking like 9.8 out of 10, <laughs> you know, <laughs> enjoyment level or something. But Last Crusade, I feel like my appreciation and my enjoyment are on an even plane with each other. So I mm -hmm. feel like, like Alex was saying, it's just, it's not that I don't love both movies, but this movie definitely just brings out more of that excitement in me. And just like, I feel like I'm just having a blast every second of the way. Whereas Raiders, I feel like I'm having a blast almost every second of the way. <laughs> every other second. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, no, no. Because then, the, then we're like way That's down on two, seconds. Right. That yeah. math doesn't add up. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I agree with everything. I This is... As we've talked about, definitely my favorite indie movie. I was also worried, like you were Alex going in, like, is it not going to hold up? Like some of, you know, going through Raiders and Temple of Doom, I appreciated things that I didn't before, but also there were things that were bigger bumps than I remembered them to be. And I feel like that's, there are things in this movie also that struck me as maybe not 100% perfect 100% of the time, which is not how my child brain remembered it. So like, I think there's, it's a movie. It is not flawless, but I feel like it is a perfect indie movie. Like, it is what I want mm. from an Indiana Jones movie. And I feel like that's, when I say perfect, 
I obviously don't mean that like this is the most perfect movie ever made. Sure. Mm-hmm. I think for me, it's just if I want an Indiana Jones movie, I can't ask for more than this. Right. Like, it, it gives me everything and it executes it, I think, pretty flawlessly mm. within this bubble of Indiana Jones. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting. I realized or I remembered that back in high school, I made an Indiana Jones parody movie, basically. <laughs> and the structure of it was basically it begins with the beginning of Raiders of the Lost Ark and then immediately just becomes a parody of The Last Crusade. Perfect. Mm. And so it just is a, an encapsulation of how my child brain remembered the Indiana Jones series, basically. Yeah, same. Right. But yeah, definitely this time I appreciated the theme and the writing. And I, I feel like the screenwriting, I think, is. I don't want to say a higher level than Raiders. I think it's also just that this movie came out eight years later. Like it's yeah. it's kind of of a different era. And I think that's partially what makes it feel so different in some ways. Right. Yeah. Real quick. It's interesting that this trilogy bookends the 80s. Mm-hmm. Right. So Raiders is coming out of the 70s, which is a right. decade that we didn't grow up with. But then 89, Last Crusade, this is now coming out of an era that we did grow up with. Like the opening chase sequence with River Phoenix feels like it's like out of the Goonies or something. Like it's such an 80s (laughs) thing to have like, come back here, you kid, you know, or whatever. So I think that there is like a little bit of that too. These movies, especially Temple of Doom is just its own thing kind of, but these movies, two movies especially are very much a product of the almost exact end of this decade that they came out. Yeah, and I feel like that's, it does feel slightly more modern to me and mm-hmm. like yeah the exactly arc, the you know the structure of everything feels much more in line with what i would expect a, a modern conventional movie to be so i really appreciated the screenwriting i like all i want from a movie is harrison ford and sean connery tied to a chair yeah that's all i want <laughs> like, and this movie has so much of that which is great so yeah i think just i i love this movie it's a great it's a great great movie This episode of Beyond the Screenplay is sponsored by Brilliant. Brilliant is all about math and science enrichment learning, and it replaces lecture videos with hands-on interactive lessons. I can say from experience how addicting and effective their approach to learning through problem solving can be. You might not think that there's a connection between math and science and film analysis, but I really think there is. For example, there's a course on Brilliant all about scientific thinking. It explores scientific principles through the framework of puzzles. To solve a puzzle, you have to know its rules. And when the puzzle is nature, its rules are scientific principles. The course has a bunch of interactive puzzles that are fun to solve, and in the process you're learning about the laws of physics. I often think of film analysis as a kind of puzzle. You can take a movie and using the quote unquote rules of film structure and the beats of a character arc, solve the puzzle of what each scene is trying to accomplish. Once you know what it's trying to accomplish, you can better evaluate the techniques that filmmakers use to achieve that goal. As you can see, there's a reason the team likes to tease me about being a robot. Brilliant is full of these kinds of fascinating and challenging courses that provide a toolkit and a framework to work through novel problems, whatever form those problems may take. To start expanding your toolkit and learn more about Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash beyond the screenplay and sign up for free. The first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. The link is in the show notes. Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this episode. Going back to what I said, I think that so much of any movie or just like any piece of storytelling, and this sounds obvious to say, is finding the right angle on it and the right premise. And Mm -hmm. there is a lot of information out there about the development on this film in particular. And I'm not going to like walk us all the way through it because what happened was there were many drafts of this that were like leaked and, you know, made public and people have talked and disclosed a lot of the development process as well. And way more so than for either of the other two films. And it's a fascinating look into a hundred premises for Indiana Jones movies that are not as good as this premise. Mm -hmm. And I think that that brainstorming piece or just the like find the right way in piece Mm -hmm. is so critical, especially when you're working with established IP because 
that's where the real trick is. People know the characters, people know the world. But so you're going to make a new thing with established like world tone characters, plot kinds of things, genre kinds of things, but you have to make it new. And what do you do when you're approaching? And so, you know, I really recommend to people that are interested in this and in, in screenwriting and especially if at all you find yourself in the very lucky position of getting to <laughs> getting to it, you know, reimagine a piece of existing IP or like, you know, right. something like that. Indiana Jones development of this movie is a really good place to start because they just tried a lot of things that didn't work and didn't work. And it was like, Indy is here and he's fighting. I can't even remember what half the things are, but they're all dumb. They're all so dumb by comparison. <laughs> the original idea for this okay, movie. Alex knows. Yeah, George Lucas was like, I want to make a haunted like castle. Oh, movie. yeah. <laughs> so it's oh, going to be like God, a haunted okay. Nazi castle or something. As like the primary location for the entire thing. Right. (laughs) And then there was something about a monkey king at one point. And just like, thank God we don't have that. And there's a lot that, thank God we don't have it. And maybe the kind of the difference between a Temple of Doom and the Last Crusade is just that time. Time. You know, just having Mm. time to try a bunch of different things out. Obviously, little Brian is happy they didn't have time, you know, because (laughs) little Brian got Temple of Doom. (laughs) But I'm happy they had time to give me Last Crusade because it does feel like a film that wasn't rushed, that it yes. didn't feel like it was the first draft. This movie feels like it was really thought through and all those character arc beats are in the right place, hitting the right emotional moments at the right time. That's where that perfection feel comes in because I think Raiders is classic and it has the feel of a classic movie where classic movies sometimes feel uneven in a way because they were like right. the first of their kind and so they're right. not pitch perfect and so Raiders is like this kind of more unpolished thing whereas Last Crusade feels like we've nailed it like we've taken this world and we've nailed it yeah I was reading so you know in Temple of Doom I read that they had the screenwriters had six weeks to write the first draft of Temple of Doom and then they had a couple months after that and that was it before they needed to be shooting Temple of Doom. Right. And it doesn't matter how brilliant you are. If you don't have the time to really get everything nailed down, you're going to have a sloppy feeling. Not that it never comes together or sometimes like, you know, you don't, the right people aren't there to like save it. Sometimes that happens. Mm-hmm. But uh, some of the time, most of the time, if you don't have the time, you're not going to have the movie <laughs> at the end of the day. Yeah. Unless you're Ryan Johnson writing Knives Out really quickly. <laughs> okay, true. Yeah, there's rare exceptions. Well, but also that's a, an instance where there's like no interference, right? Like the situation where there's, and there's no IP. Right. So the situation yeah. where you have a lot of studio interference because the studios are really invested in their IP and then you only have six weeks. So there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen and there's no time. That's where you get the problems. We'll take a look at Knives Out too, and we'll revisit this conversation when right. that comes out. We'll see how that yeah. goes. There are movies that are miracles that are not, uh, you know, they're the exception to the rule. Of course. Of course. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's, what's also cool about this and what you're saying, Trish, about finding the right way in is there is so much in this movie, and Brian, you were alluding to this in the episode on Temple of Doom, so much of this movie is almost like a recreation of Raiders and mm-hmm. that structure of like mm-hmm. fun opening. And then we see Indy, he's back in college mm-hmm. and he's like, I feel like you could overlay <laughs> the beats and they would almost all like, you know, overlap, especially in the first half, I would say. But there is this added twist. There is this new thing that they're going to do, which is it's about Indy's relationship with his dad right. and mm-hmm. the magical object that he's searching for is also how he finds his dad. So the search for the object is the search for his father. And that's just such a great, it's so simple, but it's just exactly, it just works so well for this and gives you even more reason to want him to find it. And I feel like I remembered Sean Connery coming in earlier in the movie, but it's like 40, 50 minutes in. Yeah. Obviously in that in that opening, which we can talk about, I think it'd be fun. You know, you get to hear him and you know, they sort of tease yeah. the, mm-hmm. the off-screen Sean Connery. I really like that opening this time. I feel like as a kid, it sort of bothered me and I don't know why. I think just the idea of seeing a young indie or seeing somebody else play mm-hmm. Indiana Jones. Yeah, right. Just disturbing. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. I feel like it's a yeah. really fun opening. I feel like there is so much indiness captured 
in it. Like there's the really obvious stuff where it's like, here's how he became afraid of snakes. And here's right. how it all happened this one day. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> and he watched a guy that dressed like him, but with a different color. So there's all those stuff. But I feel like you also get to see the beginning of like the indie essence. Like this time I really liked where young Indy tries to jump on a horse uh-huh, and he misses. misses. And maybe it's right. right before that where he's like, he comes out and he's like yelling for help. And he's like, Ugh, everybody's lost but me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah. that just feels so Indiana Jones. And that was, right. I just really appreciated all the levels at which they were setting up that character in that opening sequence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I love that sequence. I mean, I think just River Phoenix as the choice is really awesome. And then I like that his like basically hero is a bad guy. Yeah. Like, that just feels so mm. appropriate for, for a sort of Indiana Jones or Han Solo kind of character. And then I feel like Obviously, it's all a, a little, you know, it's all very playful, but I feel like this was the first time as a kid I understood the concept of like a prequel thing of like, we are mm-hmm. going to show you an origin story of mm-hmm. a character. Like, here's how, you know, and it's like they're doing a prequel of Harrison Ford's chin scar, not just Indiana <laughs> right, Jones's, right. which is like really interesting. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I just thought that that was that sort of like spoke to me as a kid where I was like, oh, they're like doing a thing. They're showing me a thing that's making me understand this other thing. And that's kind of cool. It unlocked the idea of time in your childhood brain. <laughs> right. <laughs> Nonlinearity. I always return to context for characters and how critical that is. And even, you know, we were talking in Raiders about Marion and how even just hints of oh, I was running around with my father. Or like, I got dragged all over the world with my father. And like, it provides even just a tiny bit of context for that character that that creates empathy, but it also just opens our imaginations and makes her seem like she exists beyond the boundaries of the scene, right? That she mm-hmm. is a real person walking around that has motivations. And so like, we can put ourselves in the brain of somebody who had a relationship with Indiana Jones when she was really young and her, her, mm. you know, her, her father was friends with him and blah, blah, blah. And it just, we do the backstory work in our imaginations. Right. And this movie basically provides so much context for the Indiana Jones character, both in that opening sequence and by having another member of his family exist. Mm-hmm. Like that's the thing is that people have families and Like, so often I read screenplays and it's just like, this person is an enigma and you never know anything about them and they came from nowhere and they don't have any relatives or friends and no one knows who they are. And every time they walk into a bar, everyone's like, who's that stranger? Like, but that's just not what people are or like. Right. It just doesn't make any sense and it doesn't help us relate to them. Like, if you want us to believe that a character is a person then at least hint, give the barest of hints that they came from somewhere, that they have family, that someone talked to them yesterday, right? Like, (laughs) Mm. you know, anything that suggests that they exist beyond the boundaries of the scene. And actually, that's another reason why this movie is so great. It's not just because of Sean Connery and the whole father theme and character arc and everything, but also it brings back Brody, it brings back Sala and... Those are characters Mm. that have a history with Indiana Jones that we understand, as opposed to somebody like (laughs) Willie Scott, who doesn't have a history with Indiana Jones or any history with anyone anywhere. (laughs) Or a future, apparently. Right. Yeah, that's what I mean. (laughs) Again, context is what makes characters feel three-dimensional. And Mm. so this movie just adds context in spades to Indiana Jones in a way that's just, every scene is just loaded with it. It's great. Yeah, and, you know, as you were saying about Temple of Doom, like, what is this movie about? I feel like this mm-hmm. movie, like, can't wait to tell you what oh, it's yeah. about. Where it's yeah. like, we got that relationship, and it's also, like, it, like faith. Like, do you believe, like, we're going to start, like, planting all this stuff, like, very early on, and Brody's going to, like, mention it, and then Indy's going to walk and kind of look listfully toward the fireplace and ask, like, Brody, like, what do you believe? And, like, let's talk right. about what <laughs> we believe. And I feel like that scene was always a little bit goofy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like the bad guys like ransack the place, but then like shut the curtains that block off part of the living room (laughs) that you have to open. There's just like some like mechanical things that are like, okay, you had to do this for the shot to get like the Spielberg fun reveal. (laughs) But I I appreciate that the movie is like front loading it with like, these are the things we're going to talk about. And 
that they pay off and, you know, we can get to the wonderful finale in act three, but yeah, I just appreciate that this movie makes room for those conversations and to set up a compelling arc for the father and son story, despite not a ton changing. Like I, I think, right. I remembered there being a lot more, like more scenes that were more emotional with them throughout the movie and there aren't. It's like they're little moments of like mm-hmm. change. And even, you know, when they're on the Hindenburg. Zeppelin. What's it called? Thank you. <laughs> I was going to say Zeppelin. <laughs> the um, <laughs> not the actual Hindenburg. Right. <laughs> All blimps are the Hindenburg. <laughs> right. I would have, that would have been dramatic. <laughs> Long time. But, you know, that's that moment is interesting because that's kind of the first time Indy is, you know, confronts his father and mm-hmm. is like, you were never there. Like, you know, we didn't get to talk. And then Sean Connery is like, well, I'm here. Like, say something. Like, what? No. Like, you want to talk? No, I didn't think so. Let's get back to the adventure. Yeah. yeah. And like, I lo- Real quick, I love his line. Last time we shared a quiet drink, I had a milkshake. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just love that line. <laughs> anyway, so it's just interesting revisiting the arc and seeing it playing out differently then I remembered it. Like the emotionality of it was greater than what's actually on the screen, which I think is good. Yes. Right. And I think what I love about the scene you just described, Michael, was actually I got a different meaning out of it this time as an adult where I didn't take Indy's inability to say something there as he has nothing to say. I took it as like, where do you want to begin? Like we don't have a relationship. Mm -hmm. What do you, what do you even know about me? I don't know what you even know about me. You want me to just to like start right now, as we sit here on this blimp, I think all the scenes that are in there for the father-son arc are exactly the right moments. And it's just enough that I don't get tired of it, you know, because there there are movies where you can just sense there is a little bit bit too much of a cerebral approach of, you know, we know we need to have a father-son arc. So like, here are the obligatory scenes. And this scene is here a little bit too long because we're going to try to milk your emotions. And this movie never makes me feel like I'm being dragged into those obligatory scenes. They just kind of happen naturally along the journey Mm -hmm. at just the right moments. And it's, I'm never feeling that meta annoyance at the movie of like, here's the scene where we got to do this. Like, (laughs) all right. (laughs) Well, absolutely. And one of the things that this movie does spectacularly well is a lot of these moments that we are talking about either happen in the midst of the action sequences or arise organically out of the action sequences or just otherwise the journey that, of the adventure that they're on. Right. And so even the beginning when we first meet Henry Jones Sr., it's Indiana has come running in and barely survived something and like escaped with his life and he has this priceless artifact, right? And he's trying to get mm. his dad's attention and his dad will not pay attention to him at all during that scene. And it's such a character beat for both of them but it's also, it goes by quickly and then we get into the, okay, now here's the sheriff has arrived and like, here is, you know, you're going to have to confront these guys and give away the cross of Coronado and whatever. They're so well implanted in the like action of the movie that they never feel tacked on and they arise naturally out of what's going on. Also, there's a masterful character mirroring thing going on where it makes perfect sense who Indiana Jones is if Henry is his father, right? Where Mm -hmm. like, he's so obsessed with his search for the grail, right? I love how in that scene that you're talking about at the, at Indiana Jones's house where he's talking to Brody and he's like, grail lore was his hobby. It's like his hobby. (laughs) I don't know if that's the word, Mm. but yeah. He's obsessed with it and, you know, ignored his son for most of his life. And it just becomes, you know, it all spills into that conversation that they have on the Zeppelin. But it's just really well-observed character work there where those two feel like pairs of each other, where somebody like Henry, you get a kid like Indiana who ultimately has very similar interests to his father, Mm -hmm. but feels still resentful of the fact that that always took precedence over his relationship with his son. And again, they're just, they're sprinkled every time there's a character moment. It's like something is going on that's like the action scene where it's like Henry like, you know, sends up the seagulls to like choke out the plane engine. And Mm -hmm. then like they're on their way to 
Berlin or whatever, they have to like, they stop at that crossroads and they have that like brief conversation about like, well, we have to go get the grail diary. It's over there and all this stuff. It's great. Yeah. And something that makes me think of, and you brought this up a little bit, Trisha, on the Raiders episode of Indy feeling like an everyman, basically, Mm. where it's like he can screw up and stuff. And I think that, yeah, I think about this, like the very two-dimensional, closed-minded sense of like masculinity and like what's a man's man and stuff like that. And I feel like you hear Indiana Jones being referenced as that character by men who are like this, you have to be this kind of man, like Indiana Jones. And I feel like those people are forgetting that Indiana Jones is like scared and excited and is seeking approval from his father. And then his father, who's James Bond, it must've been so fun for Sean Connery (laughs) to be like the hapless one, you know, he (laughs) is hapless and sort of playful and that kind of thing. And and they have emotions and they just feel like well-rounded, sensitive people, you know? So it's like, yes, if you, if you think Indiana Jones should be your like target for masculinity, then great, but actually go watch the movies again and and understand that like the character is not just like the completely cold, sterile character that maybe you remember him to be. Mm. Well, that's one of the most delightful things about Henry and what Sean Connery brought to that performance is it's not just, I am the cold, distant father right. who is steely or, you know, more professional than you at disposing of enemies or just some like mega version of Indiana Jones. He's like the hapless professor kind of goofball in a lot of scenes. And, and he's he's shocked at what Indy just did. And he can't believe what's happening. This is crazy. And I, the, having that energy in those action scenes, it just brings another layer and humor and these dynamics that... Once again, you know, in a Temple of Doom or a Raiders, you have these great action sequences, and they have they do have different layers going on. But this movie has even more layers in each action scene because yep. you've got the father son dynamics always there, and you've always got the interplay between the two of them. You know, there's some earlier ones, you know, with with Elsa and Indy on the boat and stuff. But once Sean Connery comes into the picture, every action, no action scene in this movie is boring to me. Like, uh, like I get bored by action a lot nowadays. I, I actually kind of zone mm-hmm. out during extended action sequences, and I did not zone out once during this movie. And I think it really is because I just love watching these two characters do anything together. And and that's just a great lesson, I think. You know, if you're making an action movie, make it so that the action is almost like secondary to the characters in the action scene. Mm -hmm. Like I would watch them do anything anyway. So how cool is it that they're also happen to be in this amazing action sequence? And that's where this movie just, that's why every part of it works for me in a way that Raiders and Temple of Doom just don't. It's a tricky balance to strike because, you know, we have action sequences that are characters that are thrown together but they hate each other so they're kind of trying to antagonize each other even while they're like trying to escape from whatever you know i feel like that's a lot of james bond movies do that and you know they stick somebody with bond and that person hates bond actually and it's you know a big like conflict but it's like well you're the only one who can get me out of this alive so i guess i'll go with you but this has like a dynamic that i don't know if i've ever seen before and it's because the characters like I said, they feel like two different versions of men that are really similar in some ways, but have like made different choices in life. And so mm. it's just really great to see that, yeah, Sean Connery's character, that Henry Jones Sr., he is afraid at different parts of what Indy is doing or shocked, I guess, is the word that you used. And that's more accurate. But he's not necessarily like, you know, ever panicky or losing his composure. He's slightly inconvenienced, it feels like, most of (laughs) the time. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, basically, like, is more concerned about the state of the world, almost, than he (laughs) is about, like, what's happening, you know, right in front of him. And, again, it's just really good writing where the moment where um, he's in the tank and the one German comes down and is hitting him with his glove. Mm -hmm. Right. And he's like, why would you come back for the Grail Diary and and smacking him across the face with his leather glove? There's that amazing moment where Sean Connery reaches out and grabs the Nazi's wrist before he get right before he hits him with his glove again and gives him this very steely glare and is like, you know, goose stepping moron such as yourself should try reading books instead of burning them. 
it's so, this is where Indy came from. We start to see that resilience and that strength and that hatred of Nazis that we love so much. (laughs) And it tells us so much about who Henry is and what Indy has inherited from him. And so you can't have Henry being such a pushover or so flustered all the time. I I agree he's hapless, but not flustered. You can't have him being flustered all the time. Otherwise, Indiana Jones makes no sense, right? He has to have this sort of inner resolve and this strength and this sort of like compass to him in all of these scenes where he's essentially always calm, even when it looks really grim. I don't know. It's great. Right. It's perfect. It's not a Willie Scott character, you know, Yes. always screaming, always freaking out. Yeah. He's not that character. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, and that it's, I think, beyond just the not screaming, it's that he's, the <laughs> there's a relationship there because it's a character. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about this a little bit in Temple of Doom, but I think partially why some of those action scenes are so fun, like you're saying, Alex, is that they're not, it's not just action to watch people jump off of stuff for a little while. Like, all the beats in them are these character beats where yep. either Indiana Jones has, like, come to rescue his father, but now they're like tied up and he's screwed up. And so he's got to prove to his, like, look at what I did. Like, I just got us out of this crazy situation. And then Sean Connery like looks at him with disapproval or like, look what you just <laughs> did, Junior. Like, right. So I feel like there's, there's character stuff happening constantly and it does evolve. You know, Henry Jones senior does contribute like, you know, the, the birds on the beach thing, right. Mm-hmm. He uses right. just like the cleverness to take down this thing in a way that Indiana Jones is more, I'm going to, charge in there and crash something into it and then hopefully everything will be fine but that also happens right after he's asked to be a gunner in a plane and shoots out the back of it like as one would probably do in that situation Mm -hmm. Uh, right but then he just flat out lies about it you know as you were saying like he's sort of like he has his own internal logic which is what makes him the the father of indiana jones he's like oh they got us like you (laughs) didn't see it i I love that moment it's so good good. (laughs) yeah yeah and like and that reveals like vulnerability about henry jones senior also like like they all have like dynamics and all these character and revealing character through action and Mm -hmm. choices and i feel like that's also why some of the the goofier parts that are like you know on purpose supposed to be goofy but why they work for me in a way that Sometimes they don't in the other movies, you know, where like they stumble upon a spinning like trap door fake wall. So like Adam West Batman. (laughs) It is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) And like it's it's silly. It's very similar to sequences in Temple of Doom and Raiders of the Lost Ark. But because I'm so engaged with the characters and how they're reacting to each thing and how they're going to react to each other reacting to each thing, like it's fun and engaging and entertaining and keeps that that interest there the whole time. And I feel like that's also why it's such a big shock when they shoot Sean Connery, when it gets to act three. Yes. And mm-hmm. like I somehow, not that I forgot, but I just, I experienced it like the first time, the surprise of like, oh, wow. Like, right. what a great dramatic choice where now it's, you know, returning to theme, like Indy's got to go prove his faith and like prove his love for his father all at the same time. But there's a ticking clock because his father's going to bleed. Like it's, it's <laughs> this is what I'm saying. <laughs> this is how you do act three, everybody. Yeah. This is what you do. Yes. Raise yeah. the stakes. All of the things at once. Kind of a topic switch here, but we've talked about obviously a lot in Temple of Doom, but also in our episode on Raiders, you know, the Indiana Jones girls, you know, we, there, there's, it's like Bond girls. You always got to have an Indiana Jones leading lady in these movies. And I know Marion is like the default kind of like, she's the one, she's the tomboy adventure person. She belongs in Indiana Jones movies and she's everybody's favorite. But I love Elsa. I like Mm -hmm. Elsa too. And I think it's because a lot of this movie, especially in the Venice sequence, almost feels like a Bond movie. And she feels like a Bond girl. Mm -hmm. She's the femme fatale Bond girl. And that is like my jam. And I I really love the twists and turns with her character. She's complex in this interesting way. Like she, they somehow made her, she's aligned with the Nazis, which generally means like you're just completely bad at no redemption at all. But they do try to make her this three-dimensional character where she's not cool with Nazis 
burning all these books and right. destroying history. She's in it for the actual archaeology history of it all. She happens to be aligned with the Nazis, but she doesn't really care about their ideology. So I just yeah, I, I just find her to be a really interesting character, mm-hmm. and I've I've always yeah she's always been my idea of like a cool Indiana Jones female character mm-hmm. you know, right. in a, in a way that the other two just never really like meant much to me mm-hmm. right, and it's always a fun trope just the the bad guy who's like not totally on board with the bad guys right who, you know mm-hmm. so yeah and the dangerous it, I think there's the femme fatale element too like there's something sure. fun about. Yeah, the mutual attraction and you know that scene in Berlin where he's got her by the throat mm-hmm. and you know, with the line that she has the greatest outfit. That's such like an amazing <laughs> yeah. hat and like her lipstick is so good. It's just like you're doing it. Uh, yeah, but yeah, all I have to do is squeeze. squeeze. All I have, all to, I have to do is scream. scream. Right, just like ah, oh, so good. No, I love Elsa. I think that she is a really cool archetype you know we talked about how the other jones girls are in two different completely different archetypes and then you have elsa who does seem like she's borrowed more from a james bond or or even borrowed more from yeah like a a film noir right Right. um but she's smart is the thing she's a doctor they're like how are we gonna know this dr schneider and it's like oh hello i'm dr schneider and she's Mm. got that she's got that uh veronica lake hairstyle (laughs) right sort of Mm -hmm. down one side of her face and but I also agree with you, Alex, that it's it's nice to see Indiana Jones like interacting with a woman in a way that is like overtly flirtatious in a way that I find believable and very charming. Mm. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, his interactions with Marion, there's just sort of like this, like his girl Friday banter, like you're a tomboy. And and then his interactions with Willie Scott are just all <laughs> over the map and right. don't make any sense. And also are we hate fun, each other, but now we want to make out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no. We're but, hot, so. Right. But it's like with Elsa, it's like we turn around, there's an incredibly gorgeous woman who is also the doctor that we are looking for who's going to explain to us the historical significance of the thing that we're doing. And she's very much somebody that in real life, Indy would be stupid not to be interested in, right? And so like- right. The fact that they have this he's very charming sort of flirtation going on right at the beginning where he like grabs that flower for her. And but then when she's in the tomb of the night, you know, she's not scared. I love the scene where she's like wading into the petroleum and she just kind of like takes off her jacket and is like, okay, this is what I'm doing now. And Mm. she they have that shot of her high heeled shoes walking along (laughs) where there's like rats there. She's like walking Mm -hmm. along the edge of that like petroleum canal and she's like the back of her head is up against a shroud behind which is hundreds of rats. And (laughs) she's just concentrating on not losing her footing. Right. It's such a marked contrast to both Marion and to Willie Scott. And it's like, well, she looks like a total smoke show, but is also good at archeology span and is super (laughs) smart. And there's a lot that's just cool about the character. And, you know, like in that library catacomb scene, she's as hungry as oh, Indy yeah. for finding right. these things. You know, she's as excited to uncover the grave and the tablet and all that stuff. So it's just fun to watch a character beat his peer. And, right. Right. and just, it's not, she's not like stuck with him against her will. Like she's yes. there because she wants to be. She drives that boat during that amazing boat chase. Right. And yeah, it was something I said during the last episode Mm -hmm. briefly is, is that sort of Marion is like, if you think of Indiana Jones as like this professor and this adventurer, like Marion feels like the adventurer counterpart basically. Mm -hmm. And then Elsa feels like the professor counterpart. And it's not that they both can't be both. Like Marion is smart and Elsa is adventurous, but it's sort of like they took those two main parts of Indy's personality and gave them to these two leading ladies. Mm-hmm. And they gave and they gave Elsa a goal, right? She wants the right. grail, as you're pointing out, Alex. And so that makes her really active secondary character. And ultimately, you know, she does a lot to affect the plot because she's a driven person where, you know, Marion is great, but unfortunately for her, she gets kind of dragged along most of the movie. Right. Whereas Elsa feels like she's driving the plot in as much as she possibly can because she also is after the grail for her own reasons, so... 
And I love, I think, you know, that all kind of crystallizes again in that ending sequence where they get to the grail mm-hmm. and big bad guy dude is like, I don't know which one to choose. Like you choose for me. And she chooses and it's that great kind of betrayal, right? Yep. Where she like recognizes yeah. that this is the real end. Like we got to dispose of this dude. So here, drink the this look thing. at her face is so good. Yeah. And she gives right. him the grail. And like yeah. the exchange that they have. And then yeah. as soon as he's out of the picture and they're like, okay, we've got to find the real one. She's there actually like helping Indy. And so it right. is. Right. Well, and she's the one who says it wouldn't be gold. Mm-hmm. Like, right. Yeah. yeah. So she, she knows. They're working together to solve a puzzle. And I feel like that that happens a couple times in this movie. And I think that is really fun to see that co-puzzle solving. And then it's that, you know, the beautiful slash tragic ending where she just mm-hmm. can't let can't go. Let go. Mm-hmm. And so like falls to her doom. And then Indy's there and he's going to do the same thing because it's like, I can get it for you, dad. It's right. But then, you know, then he calls him Indiana. It's just okay. <laughs> if theme. Yes. If all it happens when there's theme. theme. It uh-huh. does it all. Yeah. If only Elsa had had a nickname that Indy could have called her for the first time. She <laughs> right. Saved her life. Yep. Right. Um, I love actually, I was thinking of the image that came to mind during that scene where Henry's holding Indiana Jones by the hand and saying like, give me your other hand. Mm-hmm. It was so Return of the King with Sam and Frodo. Mm-hmm. Where it, like, Frodo has to make the choice to like give him. It's for like, different reasons, but all right. there's a lot of things watching all three of these movies that I was noticing just moments and shots and situations that I, I feel like are, are in so many other movies that followed. And it might just be unconscious on the part of people like Peter Jackson, who has also probably seen and, and adores these movies the way we do. Right. But I, I noticed watching this whole trilogy, like, oh, wow, like, that's where this, I've definitely seen this in recent blockbusters mm-hmm. that came later. Right. I had that with this trilogy and thinking about Pirates of the Caribbean, the first one. Right. Which is, you've got the exact same punch shot, like where he first sees Marion. Mm-hmm. That's the the running gag in Pirates. Not sure I deserve that. And then <laughs> just like randomly, the bad guy has to put the lady in a dress for no reason. Like right. wear this to dinner. <laughs> and then in the River Phoenix sequence, you get him grabbing onto the to whatever it is and like swinging around in a circle which is like jack sparrow doing the handcuffs thing there's just a lot where i was like you know obviously movies like the mummy and pirates of the caribbean and lord of the rings to a lesser extent but still very much are that is why we love them is because they were like hey look at these like fantastic adventure movies from not that long ago maybe let's try to do a lot of that stuff but in our own way Mm-hmm. And of course, these movies building upon the adventure movies that have come before, and like right. as we talk of course. about the serials and swashbuckling as as old as movies and all that stuff. And I, th- I think that is yeah why these movies are so fun. As you're saying, is that it? It is just like a tradition of moviness that that is captured yeah. and like all wrapped up in like the Indiana Jones series of like this is right. something that is uniquely movie. Like there aren't other genres that do this kind of thing in a way that a movie can do Indiana Jones. Well, and sorry, just returning to what you were saying, Brian, about some of the particular stunts that feel like they're related to other, you know, classic Mm -hmm. sort of like swing on a chandelier kind of Errol Flynn kind of thing. Mm -hmm. What makes Indiana Jones so wonderful, even going back to Raiders and this movie has so many spectacular examples of it is that he goes to do like a classic stunt and it fails, right? Or Mm. there's something that goes unexpectedly or wrong. And in a way, he feels more adaptable in some ways even than somebody like Jack Sparrow where he's sort of able to like punch his way out of stuff that, you know, other characters are not and just sort of dodge his way out of things too in a really surprising way. He's just really good at improvising things. I was was thinking back, to that train sequence at the very beginning where he falls into the pit of snakes and then like the snake comes out of his shirt and bites the guy on the wrist, like right when he needs to get out of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then it's right after that, that he grabs the arm of the thing around the water tank or whatever it is and like swings all the way around and then lands very ungracefully right on his back in front of Fedora. And at the very, very end of that sequence, he escapes in that single shot through the magic caboose, right through the box. Because <laughs> yeah. it's, a cool, it's a cool trick, Spielberg. Like, yeah. <laughs> after this, let's talk about stunts. But anyway, all of this speaks very much to the character. It's like that every man kind of thing. 
but it also is having fun with the genre, right? And it's what yeah. makes Indiana Jones so endearing is the way that he improvs his way out of situations he gets himself into. And, you know, we see it with Raiders. I don't know, I'm making this up as I go along. And then he's making up even more stuff as he goes along in The Last Crusade. He gets into the boat and then like sends the boat off down the river to as a decoy for the Nazis. I love that right. moment. Right, yeah. and then, yeah, Henry but tries then they to don't throw wait, him like, his... They don't. Right, or yeah. look at it's it. It's like, let let the Nazis get into their on boat. On a boat, and like on, take, yeah. take off for a minute. Yeah. No, it doesn't make sense. But again, it's that sort of like wonderful improv that we see from Indiana Jones all the time that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. And both are fun to watch. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's something that the later Mission Impossible movies do really well is, yeah. is it just like, I just barely pulled off this insane thing. And I think that not only adds urgency and tension to the scene, but it also makes us believe that it happened because it didn't go perfectly. It went right. as almost off the rails as you thought it might, but like just barely the person didn't fall to their death, you know, launching themselves onto the top of the Burj Khalifa or whatever <laughs> is going on. And <laughs> right. they were talking but, about the hook of the helicopter that caught on the ledge. All of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think that's what happens at the end of the, the kind of the parallel action sequence in this movie to the Raiders one where in Raiders mm-hmm. it's the Indy has to ride a horse and somehow catch up to a caravan and get the Ark back and somehow manages to. In this one, it's like, I got to get my dad back, but now there's a tank and so yes. there's, it's like, it's very similar, but it's, it's that narrowly missing things go wrong, but he makes the best out of it. And somehow by the end, he's taken out a tank with just riding a horse. Right. But the end of that, that sequence is him climbing up, mm-hmm. you know, there's the, the fake, the fake out death where Sean Connery is like, I never told him anything. Yeah. But you get to see Indy be like, God, I am so tired. And like that was <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that yeah. was a whole lot, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, that scene is such an amazing evolution of its parallel in Raiders because you know, in Raiders, it is about just the physical action. It's about I gotta get this thing. This is an impossible task. And somehow you're gonna watch me pull it off. And it's like it's an inanimate object that I need to get to and I'm going to have to dispose of all these bad guys to get to it. And this is kind of it almost like sums up the difference between the two films for me is in Last Crusade, you've got parallel storylines happening. You've got Henry and Brody in the tank with their own drama going on. I care more about him getting Henry than mm-hmm. I care about him getting the arc personally because I'm invested in their you know their character arc and the the two stories are influencing the action from different directions and causing things from the outside to happen inside and vice versa. And so, yeah, it just feels like they took Raiders and like almost like remade it with just more dynamics, more layers, more character at every moment. So, yeah, it just feels like a, that's the, once again, the perfection to me is it's like you took the thing, the Indiana Jones thing, and you did like all the layers at once in every scene. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, and it, it doesn't feel like just more to do more. It's, right. it's like you're saying, it's there's it's more the right character. It's kind of more. It's more yeah. Mm. like, yeah, story as well as like, let's yeah. be big and fun with the action sequences. Because more would have just been, there's an object inside of a tank instead of a car. You know, like <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> that would have been the, you know, the more is more kind of blockbuster approach of instead of him chasing a car, he's chasing five tanks and he disposes of all five tanks. Guys, do you want to go see Fast 9? Right exactly. <laughs> And, you know, and there's another layer at work here that really, watching it again, I remembered how much work it does, which is John Williams' music. Mm -hmm. And I think this movie, more than the first two, has so many great themes. And there's themes attached to the grail, to the father-son relationship, like it, it, to the Nazi. The Nazis kind of have this great, almost empire, Darth Vader kind of theme. Yep. And that, like... It's that classic Spielberg, George Lucas, John Williams magic of like the themes coming in right at the right time to make me feel the emotion that I want to be feeling. And they're good themes that, 
that make me emotional. I, I it's just that's I just love this movie and I love the soundtrack. It's just so and like the way they're mixed. Where like sometimes you know sometimes it's the big you know Nazis are here. We are this is bad. Like feel right. bad. But sometimes yeah. it's just like the little like sneaking in of like dun, yes dun, dun, that makes mm. you be like oh yeah this is a moment that's happening. You're right <laughs> movie. Yeah, and and the Grail theme because the Grail theme can both mm-hmm. have this really big, right. grand, you know, like the whole horn section blasting, or it can have this really subtle. We just found a little clue. We, we're you know, <laughs> we're on the trail, so it's just uh, it's just that delightful. Like I can sit back and relax because <laughs> I'm in such good hands. All, everybody's at their top, top of their game. I can just go along for the ride, and it's going to feel good the whole time. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's interesting with Williams as a composer because. He is very capable of doing lots of subtle, more sparse orchestral, like, you know, far less orchestral. Like, he could create an amazing theme with, like, two instruments, right? Or, like, two notes, as we saw with Jaws. Mm. So it's like, (laughs) he can do a lot with a little bit. And yet, because of the fact that he, you know, early in his career, started working with Spielberg and Lucas, and they were doing these throwback, huge, archetypal, hero's journey, massive adventure stories like space opera and like, you know, adventure serials. And he just very quickly ended up sort of stumbling into, I mean, like Williams is so talented and and so incredible, but like he got so good at doing this kind of thing, this like broad American sweeping orchestral score. That's like the biggest theme you've ever heard. That is so cinematic, of course, right? Like gone with the wind level of, you know, scores and everything. And thank God, like, (laughs) you know, like I love all of Williams' scores. You know, he, he writes beautiful music and he's done nearly all of Spielberg's movies, even some of the ones that, you know, most people haven't seen. And and he writes beautiful little scores for them and things like that. Little is still not the word, but you know, he, he writes more simplified sort of, or like less assertive scores right. for them. Right. But with this, I feel like it's just, you turn John Williams loose on a big yeah. cinematic adventure and you're going to get a really big cinematic score that is so iconic that you just can't compare anything to it anymore. If anyone ever has a chance to go see him in concert, you know, he's getting up there now. And so he's probably not going to be conducting very much longer, but he does, you know, conduct at the bowl every year at the Hollywood bowl every year. And I've been to see him a couple of times and the Raiders theme is one of the usually ones he plays at like his fourth encore. Right. And like, they finally (laughs) busted out and it, it doesn't matter. Like you've been cheering yourself hoarse with all of his amazing scores the entire evening and yet when the Raiders theme starts up, you are just like weeping, or at least I am. It's just mm. so, in, I don't know, it's inspiring. Nothing else captures the mood of these movies the way that William Score does. Right. Yeah, like I feel like he's the epitome of music being cheat codes. Like, oh, if you, right. Like yeah. this or Star Wars without the William Score might be terrible movies. Like mm-hmm. there's no way to but, like yeah. measure that, but like I'd be willing to bet a fair amount of money that like a different score means these movies aren't Are classics bad. for forever. Like yeah, yeah. a right. bad score underneath this exact same cut might entirely ruin Could it. Be. Like, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I also think he does. Uh, there's a lot with like not love scenes necessarily, but like flirtation scenes mm-hmm. in these movies where like Raiders, I got a lot of sort of, Han and Leia type feelings from just the music that would just sort of show up in the middle of an exchange. Mm -hmm. And John Williams is probably part of why I really like the hallway Indian Willie scene in Temple of Doom. Oh, yeah. It's because it's so playful and it's so fun and it's just like keeping everything alive. This episode of Beyond the Screenplay is sponsored by Massive. If you're a filmmaker, you know that modern filmmaking runs on massive files. You're probably shooting 4K or even 8K footage, which can amount to terabytes of data. This becomes a huge problem when you need to share footage with someone working remotely, because most cloud file transfer solutions limit you to just a couple hundred gigabytes. This is where Massive shines. 
Massive doesn't limit the amount of data you can send. Massive has 150 servers worldwide, which means large files don't have to travel far between data centers. And those files are traveling at maximum speed because Massive doesn't throttle performance. Massive's pay-as-you-go model means you only pay for what you need, and transfers are encrypted, so no one but the sender and recipient can access the files. And on top of it all, it's super simple to create an account and quickly transfer terabytes of data over the cloud. Sending a large file with Massive is as easy as sending an email. And if you sign up today at massive.io slash beyond dash the dash screenplay, you can get 100 gigabytes free toward your transfer. That's massive.io slash beyond dash the dash screenplay for 100 gigabytes of free transfer. The link is in the show notes. Thank you to Massive for sponsoring Beyond the Screenplay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, speaking of things that make these movies work, can we talk about Harrison Ford? Yes. And his performance? Yes. He's the, the main guy? He's Henry, <laughs> yeah. Henry yeah. Jr., I think? Yes. Henry Jr. Henry, Henry Walton Jones Jr.? Yeah, okay. He very nearly wasn't cast in these movies, and... Just how lucky we insane. all are. I know that they, right. they cast Harrison Ford. Like they tried not to. Like that's how I know. Right, <laughs> nearly he wasn't. Like they were they were avoiding it, right? Like Yeah. They're like, Lucas well, he just did Han Solo, so it's like, right. uh, is it gonna Lucas, be too like, obvious? I don't, don't want to have to work with Harrison Ford the whole thing, like with every movie I make. Like, you should be so lucky, George Lucas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here's the thing about Harrison Ford, though. So for those that have been listening along, you'll know that I've recently watched all of the Harrison Ford movies. (laughs) It's not every single one. I watched all of the Harrison Ford movies between 1977 and the year 2000. And that's like all of the big theatrical release ones. He did other like little things here and there, just caught all of the major ones for no reason whatsoever. But (laughs) having looked at his face now for quite a while and also like thought a lot about his acting, I'm not sure that he's a really great actor. Mm. I don't know if I would say that, but he has that movie star thing where it's just like, maybe this is acting. Probably it's not, (laughs) but like the camera wants to look at you so badly. And so do I. And like, there's just something really charismatic and believable about him. He's really solid in scenes. And, And I don't know what I mean exactly when I say that, except he's sort of the magnetic center of any room that he's in. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't even have to be doing anything for that to be true. Like he can just definitely be like sitting there and doing nothing. The scene in Raiders where he's in the restaurant with Belloc and it's after he thinks Marion has died. They're in Cairo. And he's like, you know, despondent. He's like drinking in this restaurant and Belloc is there. And Belloc gives this whole monologue about like, we're actually very similar, you and I, and blah, blah, blah. There's the way that Spielberg shoots it is really interesting where you can't see Harrison Ford's face. You kind of are seeing his profile coming in from the left side of the screen. And you see Belloc mainly on the right side of the screen, mostly facing camera. And it's like a long several sort of, you know, monologue or like lots of lines where Belloc is giving his whole thing. And we don't see Indy's face and half of it's in shadow and it's not really on camera. And then he turns and he looks at Belloc and he's like, you want to see God? Let's go meet him (laughs) together. I've got nothing Mm -hmm. better to do. But the whole time that that is going on, all you're just desperate to see Harrison Ford's face. You're just desperate to see what he's doing. And and 90% of the time, it's nothing. Like, that's the best part about Harrison Ford's acting is that his face is not doing anything most of the time. And he, But he just is so present and, like, larger than life in every scene that he's in. I have a quote really quickly that I'm going to read from Roger Ebert, which is about Harrison Ford. And I couldn't agree more. This is actually, Roger Ebert wrote this right after Raiders. And he wrote... What he proved in the Star Wars movies and went on to prove again and again is that he can supply the strong, sturdy center for action nonsense. In a scene where everything is happening at once, he knows that nothing unnecessary need be happening on his face, in his voice, or to his character. He is the fulcrum, not the lever. Mm. And I think that that's a really Mm. accurate assessment of Harrison Ford built an entire career on that sort of 
strong, just sort of presence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Agree with all that. And I think that there are a number of actors and there's a, num- a, a small number of them that are this size. And I think Harrison Ford, Jack Nicholson, maybe Pacino and De Niro, who they are cast to be themselves on screen, mm-hmm. basically. Right. And that doesn't mean they don't have range. That doesn't mean they can't play different characters. That just means that is their primary draw is like you are a magnetic or powerful or interesting or all of the above person. And the main reason you're in this movie is to be you on screen. Yeah. And I think what makes all these actors you know, everyone I named, some of the best actors uh, around are the fact that they they do have some range and they are, like I think Harrison Ford is someone we haven't seen a lot of range from, but we've seen commitment to anything he is doing in sure. the moment, you know? So in Temple of Doom, when he's in the black sleep, he is like an evil mofo, like, or when he's trying to get <laughs> a, attention from his dad, he's like, dad, didn't you see the thing? Like he's, he's, su- he's suddenly a kid. Like you see a child yeah. like show up in his eyes. And I think that's, what's great. I, we talked about this with Laura Dern at some point, I guess Jurassic Park, where it was like, I don't, I can't think of another actor who is like more willing to just go 100% to right. whatever the, whatever emotion yeah. she needs to be feeling. And Harrison Ford definitely does that for somebody who is cool and calm and collected. He will look terrified or he will look excited or whatever it is. And then here's the thing about those actors, because the reason that we love the characters they play is because of the actor. And the reason they're cast is because of who the actor is in real life. It's really, really hard to cast a younger version of them. Yep. Yeah. Solo, River Phoenix, Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, because you are now saying, I need you to believe that this entirely other person is this character who you don't just love because of the character you love because of the actor who played the character when that's like such, such, such a huge part of it. And that's the weirdest thing about seeing a prequel version of Harrison Ford versus a prequel version of Alec Guinness or something like that, where you're kind of like, Oh yeah, you can do like an Alec Guinness and get away with it where you can't really do a Harrison Ford. Mm. That is, yeah, that's a really interesting point for sure. And, and I think it is a, a movie thing also like, I like, I feel like a movie star and like a movie star actor is a kind of acting unto its own. Like I feel like there's room Mm -hmm. in film for lots of different kinds of acting and actors. And one of those slots is just the like, yeah, we need Harrison Ford on screen right now. We need Tom Cruise to basically be Tom Cruise in a crazy situation right now. Like I feel like Brad Pitt is even for me kind of in that realm Mm -hmm. where it's like, you know, and like you're saying, like it's not that they're, bad actors, but it's just like, I'm going to see this movie because I want to see what a Brad Pitt would do in this situation or or whoever it is. And I think that is just interesting that that's part of like the movie star thing is that you are going to see that movie star do stuff. And I'm curious to see if that changes over time and if the role of the movie star in cinema will kind of continue to play less of a role as we move forward into these new mediums and the who knows what that comes mm-hmm. comes after. TikTok. <laughs> that that's that's our doom that's the doomsday clock. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just want to say one more thing about Harrison Ford and actually basically Indiana Jones as well, but Harrison Ford didn't become famous until he was 34 years old, essentially, Mm -hmm. or 35 years old when he made Star Wars. Harrison Ford was born in 1942. And so he became famous in 1977. So you can do the math on that. Keep in mind that that's where he then started and then built his career upward from Mm -hmm. that point. There's hope for us. There's hope for all of us. (laughs) Yeah, I still have time. I think it's really smart and part of the endearing thing about the character is that he's already world weary. And Harrison Ford basically built an entire career on being world weary. Right. Like, Mm -hmm. and it's like he became a young, you know, he was like a quote unquote young action star. But by that, I mean, his career was young when he became famous, but he himself was not that young. And you know, it's in Raiders in 1981 that he says, you know, it's not the years, honey, it's the mileage. Mm-hmm. You know, he was in his late 30s and he was 439. Again, do math. I don't do it. But he was, 
all, you know, already pushing 40 for sure when he started his career as Indiana Jones. Yeah. And I think that that's part of the reason we really like the character is that there's no sense of immaturity to him. Mm. Like he's excitable in a really charming way, but he's not naive, right? There's already something very cynical and like sort of very hardened about Indiana Jones. And especially in Last Crusade, I think that that comes through and like, you know, his resentments against his father are very old resentments. Mm -hmm. They're not new or fresh. He's like, you were never there. It's a matter of fact thing for him to say that. He's like, well, you were a terrible father, right? And Sean Connery's like, I was mm -hmm. a great father. It's like, <laughs> both of you have this narrative going in your heads, but it's not like this fresh thing where it's like uh, somebody in their 20s, you know, wouldn't be able to say those lines without choking up. But right. Indiana Jones has so much experience under his belt that you don't get the feeling that if Henry doesn't accept him, that his whole world is going to fall apart, he'll be fine. But there is something to be gained here that was previously lost or that was given up as lost. And that sense of time is something you get out of casting an actor that's a little bit older, right? A younger Indiana Jones would and should have different life conflicts. An Indiana Jones mm -hmm. that was in a different place in his life should be about different things. And I think that that's something that doesn't get talked about often enough in film and especially in like action movies where it's like, let's just get the biggest action star we can. And if they're too old for the part or too young, then you're losing something thematic that could be going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then now in Crystal Skull, we get to talk about mm. old Harrison Ford, who just says, really just old Harrison and, Ford. And, and they told me, uh, they, you played this character before. And well, if you say so, just tell me where the paycheck is. No, don't, don't do it. <laughs> hey, now. <I> Michael <laughs> has thoughts. Wow, I have lots does. of thoughts. Yeah. Join us on Patreon. <laughs> well, and, and then that'll, I think, connect to some like Force Awakens conversations also. I feel like, mm. I feel like our Crystal mm. Skull conversation is going to go some places for oh, sure. Oh, definitely. Awesome. Well, why don't we go around and say what lessons we're going to take away from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Alex, do you want to start us off? Sure. So I mentioned earlier that there is the, you know, Sam and Frodo parallel I saw with Sean Connery holding Harrison Ford over a cliff. And another parallel I realized from Lord of the Rings was the same fake out death scenario, you know, in Two Towers, Aragorn going over the cliff. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh my God, the main character of the movie is dead in the middle of the movie. Like, so sad. <laughs> and you know, it's a trope that, you know, if you've seen more than one movie, you are aware <laughs> that that character is probably not dead yet. Right. And, and I think the lesson I took from this film was they were using this moment for a beat in the character arc, not just as a cheap fake emotional moment for the audience where we're going to use music and other characters' reactions to like lie to you and pretend like a character is dead only to bring them back later. This movie, it's actually a really beautiful moment where Henry realizes, oh my God, like I took for granted mm -hmm. that there would always be time later to maybe right. make up for, you know, the lost time, the things we didn't talk about, the things we never said. Like, oh crap, like, I just lost that opportunity. It's gone. And it's really important, I think, for that character to face that moment and then to realize he still has a chance with Indiana. So it's like it's there for a character reason that is actually quite powerful. And the movie doesn't make us have to wait for 20 minutes to yep. realize, no way, he's actually right. alive. After, you know, the movie that's called Indiana Jones, like <laughs> he didn't die halfway through. So it, you know, it very quickly reveals, no, no, he's not dead. But the moment is used not to really drag out lying to the audience. It's used to progress the character story. You can use these tropes that are kind of annoying, these action movie, adventure movie tropes in a way that is powerful and useful for the character arcs. They don't have to be used in this cheap way where any experienced audience member is not going to fall for it anyway. So like, you know, using Aragorn falling over the cliff just so that he can see the army later feels cheap to me. It's not, that doesn't feel like an earned use of that fake death. It's just a mechanical like necessity to like get a person to hear and then to hear. Mm. So if you're going to do those kind of cheap tricks, 
at least give me a character moment, at least progress the real meaningful story elements, not just mechanics. Mm. Yeah, because well, it's not it's not tricking the audience, it's tricking the character, basically, right? Like, right. it's not trying to fake us out, it's faking out a character that will then force them to take an action that they wouldn't have had that not happened. Which is a little wild that, like, only at that moment did Sean Connery be like, maybe we might die during all of this. Like, you were right. just like, <laughs> like, people have been trying to kill you for, like, days. But it is a nice moment, for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Trisha, what's your lesson? Yeah. There are a lot of just great little setups and payoffs in this movie, and it's it's a good one to study for that reason. I mean, we talk about those, you know, a decent amount, but I, I keep thinking about the, like, X marks the spot moment where you have Indiana Jones in the classroom <laughs> teaching and, you know, archaeology is not about this, it's not about that, and X never ever marks the spot. And then <laughs> part of what makes the puzzle solving when they're in the library so fun is that it has that perfect button on the end where he finds the Roman numeral 10 on the floor and he kind of just shrugs to himself and, you know, says X marks the spot. There are a lot of those little moments, like even things like Donovan saying not to trust anybody. He's like, don't trust anybody. It's like, well, yeah. And then like later on, he's sitting in the armchair facing the fireplace and he's like, I told you not to trust anybody. Uh Plenty of little things like that. There's a moment where I think it's three different characters at three different times say, ah, Venice. Right. And it becomes sort of this yeah. like callback joke when they're in Venice. <laughs> it's good writing where when a joke or a setup arrives the first time, we don't recognize it as a setup. That's the secret where it has to be subtle enough, feel organic, feel like it's a part of the character, feel like it's a part of the scene that we're not waiting for it to come back. Because if you want the difference between your audience smiling when that button comes and groaning, mm-hmm. it's you have to hide the setup really well. Mm-hmm. And this movie is great at that. You know, all three, I would say, of the I'm going to say that. Even Temple of <laughs> Doom has some setup moments that are work. And they when they are paid off, they don't feel like a groan joke. There are some that do. But overall, it is good writing and... This is the kind of exact perfect kind of genre. Like the thing about quippy action movies is that the quips kind of need to mean something. They can't just be t- completely and totally random. And so if you can, you know, call back to something that you did a good job of subtly setting up earlier, it's great. Like, and even the other instances of humor, it's just good joke writing. I don't know. The line that, <laughs> the line that Sean Connery said when he says she talks in her sleep it's right. just, yeah. uh, it just yeah. it, so He just perfect. says it so simply and, right. just, you know, just leaves it there. And Yeah, how did you know she was a Nazi? Um, yeah, it's so good. Right. And that's not a setup and payoff. But overall, like, study the humor in this, right? You need enough humor in this kind of story. That's another thing that keeps it light, that keeps the momentum up, that keeps us from being bored, is that the humor is genuinely funny. Right, yes. And there's just good comedy writing left and right in this film. There's like throwaway lines too, like one of my favorite lines where Marcus says, water, no thank you, sir. Fish make love in it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've ever it's heard just so, that. Wait, what? Yeah, just, yeah, it's, think... it's after he's like, Marcus, he's an expert. He'll disappear. Oh, and then it's like him wandering through the crowd. One, yeah. and he's, like, he's like, water, no, sir. Like, the fish make love in it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, there's a lot about that. And like, yeah, the Sala is like, Papers, yes, I have mine right here. Run, yeah, run. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh-huh, yes. yes. Oh, yeah, yeah right, right, right. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so good. All of the comedy is there's some slapstick stuff, there's some, yeah, some callback humor. All of it just works super well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And again, it's because, like you're saying, it's the setup and the investment in it, and way too often in so many genres, but I feel like especially action, people like copy the external thing where they like, they get like, oh, someone should say something funny here. Here's a random quip that doesn't mean anything. Right. Because they know instinctually like, oh, this is the part where you're supposed to like be laughing and having fun, but don't know that the reason any of that is funny is because of the setup work that gets done earlier. Right. And that's true of so many things about movies and why these movies are good movies. That's where you get the like, well, that went well, or whatever. Just <laughs> yeah. like the most random, yeah. uh, like you could <laughs> cut them and put them in any other movie. And it'd be I hate exactly. it. The one other one I hate is when there's a callback, but it's to like a meaningless thing. It's mm-hmm. you know, if, it's like Titanic 
there's a bunch of great like setups and payoffs like to making it count or whatever. Like there's there's lines that are meaningful to the characters. And I see some just bad movies where they're just repeating a line that was said earlier with like a smirk right. on their face. <laughs> right. It's like, right. but this line has no meaning for these characters. It was just said earlier. And you're saying <laughs> it again Not the as same. if I'm it doesn't give me chills when you do that. Sorry. Remember when you said that thing earlier? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> say it back to me. Exactly. I like it. Cool. Brian, what's your lesson? Don't cast Julian Glover as an American. Aw. Uh, hey. He <laughs> we're going to Venice, Italy, Dr. Jones. I am an American, <laughs> and you can tell from my accent. I always did wonder about his voice. <laughs> like, <laughs> really weird. I don't know. I feel like it plays He's as rich. that, like, yeah. Um, as that <laughs> mid Atlantic sort of like Catherine Hepburn kind of. That's how it reads to right. me. Yeah, right. he, he's like a rich person in yeah, an old it's movie. it's rich person <laughs> accent. <laughs> no, my lesson is about the urgency and the pacing, not just in the story and, and the editing and everything, but also in the setting and the scene changes mm. of the movie. Mm-hmm. So you have like normal, just cool pacing stuff, like young indie puts his head down and then when his head comes up it's present day indie and he's in the middle of a fight right we haven't explained so what good, like it's yeah. just happening but what i'm talking about more is the the what struck me this time was i couldn't remember i remembered all the big moments of this movie but i didn't always remember how they got from one to the other and in the library is where it stuck out to me where they figure out you know x marks the spot as you were saying trisha and then the next place to go is just down into the bowels of the library. Like they are there. They're already at the next stop, basically. It's not like, oh, great, we have our clue. Now we need to get a ride over to such and such so we can go do the next clue thing. And in Temple of Doom, you get the same thing with the boob statue, right? Where it's like, oh, I just got attacked. Go push the boobs. And now we're going, <laughs> yep. like, we're, we're logical next stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. But like there is this cool urgency and immediacy to that. Yeah. You have the travel montages where you have time for your characters to have respite and talk and whatever. But otherwise, you know, as we talked about with Temple of Doom, that opening 20 minutes, like everything is just going straight into the next thing. And one of the ways you achieve that is not just writing they have to get away from here so they end up here and then they end up suddenly they're in India at a village and they're going to help people. But you you also <laughs> just write it by literally having the next place to go be right there. So you don't have to, okay, hey, let's pause and refill our drinks moment because it's like, no, we are in the next scene now. Like we have done the figure it out scene and now we are straight into the action scene without a sort of like time in between to transition between the two. Yeah. They come out of the sewer from the catacombs right into Boat Chase. Like there's right, not, right. There's not a separate sequence. Yeah. It could be an interesting strategy of like almost like reverse engineering that. If you know you want people to end up here and you want a puzzle, can you build a puzzle that is right here that will then exactly. reveal it? Because it has, yeah, as you're saying, that fun revealing layers on layers. You're getting, you're just like, it's moving, it's moving, but it still feels organic. Yeah. yeah the way it all goes through that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, these movies are great at that. Awesome. Yeah, so I feel like my lesson is just, it's a really small, simple thing that struck me when watching this movie. There's, in the very beginning, there's the intro. Young Indy is fleeing the bad guys. He jumps on his horse. They're following in cars. And it's a shot where you're you're looking at Young Indy, it's like the medium close-up, he's on his horse and he's like looking around and then he looks up and he sees a thing. And so we are like, okay, he's looking at a thing. And then the camera cuts, the movie cuts to a wide shot of a train and it's like from his perspective, right? And so it's like, oh, cool, he sees that train. I've now clocked that information. And my brain was waiting for, and then it's going to cut back to young Indy and young Indy's going to like nod and be like, yes, I'm going to go toward this. And then we're going to keep going toward the train. But what actually happens is it's just those two shots where you see young Indy look up, see something, cut to his perspective of the train, and then he rides into that same shot. Mm. And mm. and you see him going off to the train. And for some reason, just this little moment captured for me, what it feels like to be in the hands of Spielberg at his best, yeah. which is where the movie is just like one step ahead of you. And it's it's not losing you. You're like, you're on the ride with it, but it knows what to do and when to do it to give you the most fun. And 
I just feel like this movie especially, but all these Indiana Jones movies are just such movies, as I've said before. Like, they're there <laughs> for the audience. They're they're orchestrated with love for you to have a good time and be surprised and go on this ride and this journey. And the filmmaking is just constantly trying to do that. And I just, I love, I think that's why Spielberg is great. And I think that's what's been so fun about revisiting all of them is just seeing like what movie cinema fun feels like when it's operating on all cylinders. Mm-hmm. Well, and you're talking about the editing and, you know, Michael Kahn, the editor, he talks about in the behind the scenes for this movie that he edits from feeling and he'll feel out, you know, how the shots should cut together. And Spielberg would even ask him, why'd you make that choice? And he's like, it just feels right. And he talks about how you can get too cerebral with editing. And if you're just editing kind of mechanically, you might make the choice you're talking about, Michael, where it's like, well, you know, the logical thing to do is he sees the train, we show the shot of the train, we cut back to him to like see his reaction to that. And like, and you can feel when movies are cutting mechanically, where there's not a feeling in the edit, but rather just an obligatory, like, it's a shot reverse shot, like, we got to go back to show this thing now, because that's what normal movies do. And that's actually often when I unconsciously or, or I start tuning out of scenes because there is a, a mechanistic feel to them. And so I, I think, yeah, there's, there is a feeling in the edit, which can only come, I think from experience and just knowing the craft inside and out. So you're operating from instinct and not from that overly cerebral, just mechanistic perspective. Mm -hmm. And in the same way that, you know, we sort of hope or are lucky to have a composer like John Williams paired with this kind of like very broad, you know, four quadrant, super American cinematic material. We're also lucky to have somebody like Spielberg who has a really strong sensibility of, or just is a really good match for this kind of stuff. And not just because he helped invent it sort of in like the latter half of the 20th century, although he did, but the way that these films are lit even is just so iconic and so not logical, not subtle, or in any way realistic, mm -hmm. but incredibly cinematic. And I remember it's in Raiders, I want to say. It's the scene where Indy is like packing because he's going to get ready to you know, go find the Ark, basically. And Brody comes over and he's like, oh, they want you to go for it. Like, go get the Ark. It's a Spielberg water. <laughs> it's a, it's mm -hmm. an amazing Spielberg water. But another amazing thing about that scene is the way that it's lit. They're walking back and forth. India's walking back and forth in front of the fireplace in his house. And like the background of his room, it's like, it's kind of dimly lit. But way in the back of the room is a fireplace. And in the top of the fireplace, beyond where you can see, there's a light like shining down so you can see the dimensions of the like brick and the logs in the bottom of the fireplace. Obviously there wouldn't be a light there. It's supposed to be the late 1930s. Why would there be a light in somebody's fireplace? There definitely <laughs> would not be Steven Spielberg, but it creates the dimensionality of the room. Like it's so, there's so many examples of this where you don't even realize Spielberg is doing it to you in terms of lighting, but he is. And of course, like, you know, these movies are, everything is like, the air is constantly full of dust and smoke and shafts of light are just dr right. dramatically streaming in from different Elsa places. Just, and, Elsa just falls into a fog machine at the end. Oh yeah, <laughs> for sure. But even the shot where they're on the Zeppelin and Indy realizes the Zeppelin is turning around, he like sees the light coming through the water glass and the shadow mm -hmm. like starts to rotate around with the, it's a vase, sorry, the vase of water on the table. Anyway, what beautiful filmmaking. And so like, again, what a great pairing of filmmaker and material. And, you know, Spielberg knew what the hell he was doing at every moment of this, you know, it's all like call back to unrealistic lighting setups of the 1930s and more power to him. Yeah, it's definitely going for style over realism. And this is, that's exactly what this movie and these series of movies call for. It reminds me of something in the Temple of Doom. Somebody was also saying, uh, or the, the DP was saying that like they would work with the craftspeople to cut holes and like the rocks that make up like the sets so that he could hide lights like in like in mm. the sets and in the light. And so it's uh -huh. also 
I feel like these movies kind of, as you're getting at, like speak to also the collaborative nature of film and that it is just all these people working, doing their absolute best to create these one of a kind movies. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, why don't we go around and say what we've been watching recently? Brian. What have you been watching recently? I haven't been watching much recently because I've been replaying Skyrim. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> nice. Which is big open world <laughs> fantasy RPG, magic, dragons, all the nerdy stuff. Really reminds me of something like Indiana Jones or Lord of the Rings where you're just like happy to be in the world. Like the, it's this beautiful, beautifully designed world, beautiful score. So I just want to, I just want to go to there. <laughs> and and like Lord of the Rings, it has just this rich lore to it. Every place and person has a story. And there's like hundreds of books you find around the world that tell little stories about the area or some object that people have been trying to find and stuff. And I realized rewatching Last Crusade how much it borrows from Indiana Jones and specifically Last Crusade. Like all the dungeons you're in have those like crypts that are carved out of the wall with like the skeletons in them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then often to get past a door, you have to read a puzzle and or like read a riddle and then figure out what it means and like observe, look around the room. And then there's literally one where you have to walk in a certain order on tiles in order to get where you're mm-hmm. going and stuff. The really cool thing is like, it's all inspired by Nordic mythology. So you, you get this rich mythology with the gods and everything, but then you also get this beautiful, like snow covered world that depending on which part of the world you're in, it's a different biome. Sometimes it's more like, autumn autumnal sometimes it's more just like (laughs) dead freezing cold and i think that it's something that you know i usually won't do like a video game unless there's some storytelling element to it but i think it's just like tolkien it's one of those examples of a game where i personally love it so much because i just feel like it is a living breathing world that i get to actually inhabit and that means a playthrough that takes over 200 hours <laughs> is still <laughs> worth it to me because I just am happy every time I sit down to play. So oh, I want to play 200 hours. Right. I, I don't know if that's a recommendation because if you haven't, you know, if you're not a gamer, don't play Skyrim. If you are a gamer, <laughs> you probably are aware of it. But <laughs> I played 200 hours of it, so I get to use it for one, one of these. Yeah. I mean, I think you could draw a pretty straight line from the Indiana Jones series to video games and what video oh, games. Oh, yeah. Became. Right. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. The Uncharted games. Right. Tomb Raider. And like, yeah, Tomb Raider exactly. is obviously one of the first big game series and borrows heavily, obviously, from Indiana Jones, but also introduces that, like, the puzzle aspect and taking yep. the same kind of puzzling that happens in Last Crusade and, and throughout mm-hmm. these movies. And Prince of Persia games. Yeah, right. there's so much of that just like adventure puzzle floor. Don't go here because arrows are going to shoot at you. Right. All that mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So just the the indie influence goes far and wide across all yep. media. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Alex, what have you been watching? So I watched Shiva Baby. It's a nice short mm. comedy feature. It's only an hour and 17 minutes, but I really enjoyed it. And I've been wanting to watch it for a while. I keep hearing recommendations. Uh, Mark Brown recommended it on our Mass Effect podcast. And a lot of our Patreon supporters on our Discord channel have been talking about it. Someone referred to it as a social horror movie. Yeah. Uh, Interesting. Which I think is a great... That's accurate. It's hilarious, but also extremely tense, extremely awkward, and basically just pushes like the worst social situation to its extremes over the course of an hour and 17 minutes. And I Mm -hmm. found it delightful and hilarious and fun. So if you want just a nice, stressful, but hilarious experience, Shiva Baby. Yeah, it's it's definitely stressful, but if you can make it through, it's it's worth it. Yeah, it's my kind of comedy. I I love just watching, you know, middle-aged parents and relatives talk at you in a way that is very real to life. And the horror of it, and and like, <laughs> hor- and like horror music being used underneath these situations, I think is right. a great, brilliant move. Sounds re- like I think I'd rather watch an actual horror movie. Yeah, like, that's that already yeah, stresses it's, me it's, out. It's, it's a little too real sometimes. Absolutely, yeah. it's not unlike watching. I'm thinking of ending things. So <laughs> that's that could be a recommendation or an absolute not, depending. I think, on I think it's a are. little more accessible Calibrate. than that one. Yes, but it's not unlike watching like. Any given like scene of I'm thinking sure. of anything <laughs> okay. like the dinner scene. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. And Trisha, what have you been watching? 
Yeah, so speaking of things that were inspired by Indiana Jones in the 1980s, growing up, I was a massive fan of the series DuckTales on the Disney Channel, which is very Indiana Jones influenced if you watched any of it. It's Mm -hmm. about Scrooge McDuck as a globetrotting adventurer, and he, you know, goes in search of magical artifacts all over the world and often has to, you know, fight mummies and other, you know, cursed people and find, you know, relics and treasure mostly is what he's looking for. And anyway, DuckTales is wonderful. The original can't be beaten. It's such a delight to watch and really stands up, but it's a little hard to get a hold of these days. Mm. What is more accessible is the remake that they did of DuckTales, which is on your Disney Plus. David Tennant. And features David Tennant as Scrooge McDuck. And Danny Pudi, Bobby Moynihan, and Ben Schwartz as Huey, Dewey, and Louie. Right. Scrooge's nephews. As someone who was a really big fan of the original, and I have watched a good chunk of the original series again as an adult for fun. I did it a couple of years ago. I got my hands on the DVDs of the original DuckTales and was watching those. I was very skeptical that any remake of this show would at all impress me or be fun or anything like that. And you know what? It really is. <laughs> it, it captures the spirit of the original. The animation is great. It's a totally different style of animation. The animation style of the new series harkens back to newspaper strip comics. It looks really cool. And it's got sort of like a modern pacing to it for sure and more sort of sophisticated joke structures that you might expect from like modern comedy things but it's definitely still a kid and family show it's really accessible it's really funny actually and also it is a stacked cast of voice talent in the new DuckTales series. So there have been three seasons so far. It started in 2017. As I mentioned, David Tennant plays Scrooge McDuck. Also recurring characters and guest spots from Lin-Manuel Miranda, Jennifer Hale, Allison Janney, Nia Vidalos, Giancarlo Esposito, Don Cheadle, Edgar Wright, Martin Freeman. <laughs> like it's... Wow. Everybody, like... Sounds pretty cool. (laughs) I didn't even name it. Like half of the people that have done like voices on the show. It's really great. So if you like Indiana Jones and you want to see an adventure show, (laughs) DuckTales is your show. It's on your Disney Plus. Check it out. Life is like a hurricane. Yeah. In duck (laughs) Race cars, lasers, It's so good. Yes, they kept the theme song. Okay, the new, good. That's the, what I got. Yes. Ask. I mean, Number it's, one they, like, they re-recorded it, but it's the same theme song with the same words. It's nice. great. <laughs> great. Uh, I wonder if like young people are like, what the hell are they talking about? <laughs> <Right. now?"> <laughs> <laughs> Have they all lost their minds? <laughs> Go watch the Danger young people. right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> it's really great. Uh, amazing. Awesome. Very cool. I started Ted Lasso. Because you oh, have nice. to, it seems. Uh, you people do. wouldn't stop talking about it. People on the Discord. The straw that broke the camel's back was my mom was like, I started watching it. Wow. You should watch it. I think you'll like it a lot. And I was like, all right, mother, I'm going to do it. You want to get to Michael? Through his mother. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <Is> it- <laughs> <laughs> early. I'm still very early, but I am into it. It's interesting. I didn't really even know like the plot of it or just the basic premise of like an uh, American football coach transplanted to Britain to teach soccer, football, football. Like, and when I learned that, I was like, is this a good, like, is is this going to be a good show? I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's been an interesting journey with it, but I appreciate it. I think once I realized and heard that like Bill Lawrence was involved in the creation of it, that helped because he, you know, created Scrubs and I was a big Scrubs fan Mm. And I feel like Scrubs did a really good job of balancing goofy humor with like surprising heart. Like speaking of Brendan Fraser, which I guess we were somewhat recently when we talked about The Mummy. Mm -hmm. You want to cry, go watch those episodes of Scrubs. Anyway, I'm enjoying Ted Lasso. I'm curious to see if the focus gets less shallow. I'm surprised to (laughs) hear that you can swear on Apple TV. I didn't think they would let them do that, but I'm surprised with some of the jokes. And I'm like, okay, Apple, maybe you're not too prudish with some of it. Mm. I figured it out that there's a formula, which is Disney Plus is like feel good family stuff. HBO Max is feel bad 
R-rated dark stuff. And Apple TV is feel good R-rated, R-rated. stuff. <laughs> yeah, which is like it's really kind of awesome. Yeah. So this is and this is basically my first like Apple TV series also. So that's mm. I don't know. It's been really interesting. I'm into it. I'm enjoying it. And I'm curious to see where it goes. It's really it's also just weird seeing this new format where it's like a sitcom, but it's not because it's a streaming series, so it doesn't have to adhere quite as much to the old way of doing things, but it's single right. camera. And it, I don't know, it's a really interesting experience that I didn't think was going to work for me, but so far has like been pretty great. And the further in I get it, the more I'm enjoying it. So yeah, the, once I got to like the second half of the first season, I was so hooked on it. So hopefully you have the same experience. Nice. Cool. I'll let you know, mom, once, once I, <laughs> I finish. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, this has been our conversation about Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, our final episode of the trilogy of the Indiana Jones series. As we've been saying, we're going to go talk about Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. If you're listening to this, it's available now on our Patreon. You can head to the show notes and click the link and sign up and listen to that conversation, which I'm very excited about. While you're there, you can also vote for our what trilogy we should be doing for a thousand patrons. So again, that'll be on our Patreon, but also on head to our Twitter. If you're listening on Spotify, check out the poll. We're really excited to yeah hear what you guys want to hear explored between Back to the Future, The Godfather, and Toy Story. So three (laughs) very different (laughs) destinies. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Choose your own adventure. (laughs) Yes. But yeah, so just thank you as always so much to the patrons that make the show possible. Thank you to our producer, Vince Major, and our editor, Eric Schneider. I'm Michael Tucker. I've been joined today by Trisha Rand, Brian Bittner, and Alex Cayeros. All of our Twitter handles are in the show notes. Send us a tweet, say hi, and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye.